Hi there, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar on attracting and retaining talent. Thanks so much for joining Jules and I today. I always love being able to do these things, particularly when it's with a Picture Partners alumni group. So we love, yeah, having you guys along and being able to continue that relationship even once you've left these four walls. Um, so yeah, I guess I just want to kick off with a little bit of housekeeping. Um, just to be able to make sure we can make this run as smoothly as possible. It is the first time Jules and I have run one of these, so please bear with us. Um, but if I just commence with, um, yeah, as we gather for this virtual event and are physically dispersed, let's recognise the various traditional lands on which we do our business today. I wish to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land we work and live on and pay respect to the past, present and emerging generations. The agenda today is short and sharp. It's really just about being able to bring some market insights to you around what we're seeing um, in the middle market, but also more broadly um, in the attraction retention space um, and being able to share with you some of the candidate trends that we're seeing um, so that, you know, it can kind of test if this sort of sits with what you've been experiencing, but also get a better appreciation of what's happening um, out there in order to be able to combat that as best as possible. Um, and also some really um, helpful tips and tricks and things that you can tangibly take away from today that you can either start to implement in your own organisations um, or I guess just be more informed um, and be able to engage in dialogue um, with peers or competitors or whoever it may be in this space. Um, so, and then, yeah, as I mentioned, plenty of time for Q&A at the end as well. Um, just before we kick off a little bit about who we are. So um, I've had the pleasure of working with some of you, which is so nice. So it's really um, yeah, heartwarming to see that you've joined. So thank you for your support. Um, but for those who don't know me, my name is Karen or Kaz Frankel. Um, I've been at the firm for about eight years. I'm currently a senior manager in the um, people and change team that sits within our corporate finance team. Um, I've been all around. I've been in BANA, PBFA, consulting, now in Port Fire, but always in the outsourced um, people and change space, um, which essentially is all about giving our clients um, confidence when it comes to people and change related matters. Um, Jules is my beautiful colleague who is going to be um, sort of taking the mid to end section of today's presentation. So we will kind of um, share today's presentation um, and Jules has been with uh, Pictures for a year um, and yeah has been a great addition and is about to go on that leave and is still here and putting in the time so very appreciative of Jules um, but essentially um, yeah we are the team along with Ryan Piper who some of you may have come across um, but yeah we're all about being here for our clients and for you guys for anything that you may need in this space. Um, so with that done, let's jump straight into some market insights. Um, radar report. So this is probably a report that many of you will be familiar with. Um, some of you may not. So I did want to just draw attention to it. Um, but essentially, um, a lot of the market insights that we um, have drawn upon around what we've been seeing um, came out of the radar report from October 2020. Two, sorry, 20, yes, 2022. Um, we are aware that well, there was a more recent one um, in July of this year, um, but that focus was sort of not in, in this space. There were certainly some people related themes that came through. Um, it did certainly highlight that this is still a real concern um, for the market, but um, we are focusing on the, um, the October 2022 um, content. Um, so within that, for those of you that aren't aware of the radar report, it is an independently commissioned report um, that sort of helps give a little bit of a finger on the pulse on what's happening out in the market. Um, it does, sorry, I'm just doing some flipping. Um, it does um, provide responses for around um, 402 um, different organisations. Um, and these are all organisations from a cross section of um, private sector, public sector, and also not for profit. Um, and they're also organisations that are from all different um, kind of stages of maturity. So um, whether that be, um, yeah, seed, growth, mature, or transitioning um, out. Um, and so you can see there, it's like a really, a really nice spread. So we know that the insights that we're getting, um, yeah, are sort of well-balanced, um, which is great. 
Um, so essentially why this report is so important is because it actually gives us a bit of an indication of what's happening out there and I guess helps people kind of go, oh, okay, I'm not alone in this. Like these are the things that everybody is experiencing um, and it really does help people come together. Um, and I guess today is about bringing those um, key insights to you around where you can be coming together. Um, and these are around four sort of key areas around people challenges um, in the attraction and retention space. So um, firstly, around staff turnover. So um, what we found is that there's up to 52% of mid-market businesses that have seen an increase in staff turnover. That is incredibly um, difficult <laughs> for businesses to run um, you know, their business smoothly when they have this level of turnover that requires, you know, onboarding, new training of opportunity, uh, sorry, new training for new staff members, um, you know, onboarding of those new staff members and essentially all of that, um, you know, intelligence that just walks out the door. Um, yeah, every time. So that's been a really key um data point for us. Um, similarly, there's been 56% of respondents that have shared that they've been focusing on upskilling existing and less experienced staff members. Um, and as you can appreciate, that sort of naturally follows from the turnover. So what businesses are saying that rather than um, sort of going out and going to market each time because of the time and effort and cost associated with that, um, they're actually looking internally to see what they can do with the individuals and the talent that they have um, within their four walls. Um, additionally, there's been 49% of respondents that have found it challenging to attract and or retain the right staff. That just sort of substantiates why we're talking about this topic today. Um, and then finally, there's been a real impact on business growth uh, where businesses have um, sort of shared that the increase in staff turnover um, has meant that they've been unable to expand um, due to staff shortages. So, um, you know, people have been feeling the pinch, um, you know, growth businesses that have been wanting to kind of, um, you know, take that next step have been hamstrung um, by some of these um, attraction retention challenges. Um, if we move on to what we're seeing more broadly in the market, um, I'm just going to touch on these because Jules is going to, you know, dig into them a little bit more when she does get to her, her piece. Um, but I wanted to sort of, yeah, share some of these concepts with you. Um, so one of those is around hyperflex being the new um, hybrid. Um, you know, obviously we saw um, what flexibility um looked like in COVID and how that has sort of evolved um, and what we're actually seeing is that that has gone to a whole new level even you know since COVID has sort of become a new normal and things are sort of starting to bounce back um, this sort of notion of hyper flexibility is very much here to stay um, and you know the concept of just working from home is no longer enough um, this new concept of the career lattice um, uh, essentially the concept of a career ladder is dead so I think um, that many of us that idea of being able to climb the corporate ladder or whichever ladder it is about you know what's the next biggest better um, more higher paying role um, is no longer what people are as concerned about and it's being able to yeah get a better balance between um, experience but also you know living their best life <laughs> um, and being able to want it all. So um, that's also a really interesting one that has come to the fore. Um, also, this concept of a Goldilocks employer, um, you know, everybody's heard of Goldilocks. It's that concept of, you know, not too hot, not too cold, just right. Um, and the middle market is just right. Um, and we are finding that the middle market space um, and those middle market employers are becoming more attractive to candidates out in the market. Um, and just finally, on the point of social recruitment, um, essentially, this is all about, you know, being able to find um, talent, but also place talent um, and people looking for jobs in a way that's different to before because of the focus that social media and, um, you know, not things like just LinkedIn, but, you know, TikTok and Instagram and all of this um, has had a real impact in the way that um, businesses are needing to actually step up their game um, if they're wanting to attract and retain the right people. Um, 
candidate trends. Um, so this next piece is really all about bringing to you what we're seeing um, with candidates out in the market. Um, you know, it's no surprise, flexibility is still very much um, up there. Um, and, you know, when Jules talks a little bit more about the hyperflex, it really just substantiates what candidates are wanting and what businesses needed to continue doing. Um, and this really needs to be alongside all of the other sort of hygiene factors around pay and career progression and all of those things. Um, stability versus salary. So this is really one where it's just dependent on the individual, where they're at in their life and their career stage. But for some, it's really about just being able to have a steady paycheck because of what we're seeing um, out in the world in terms of um, yeah, interest rates and cost of living and everybody's certainly feeling that pinch. So for many, that has become more of a focus. <clears throat> excuse me, um, whilst for others, it's very much about um, money <laughs> um, and knowing that they are um, highly sought after and that they can jump and five people will say, well, okay, we want you and they're happy to kind of put their money where their mouth is. So um, that's still very real. Um, we've also seen um, an increase in contract negotiations um, you know, we're seeing sign-on bonuses, people paying out clawbacks, um, people moving just for a promotion if they're not getting it where they currently are, um, and also an increase in visa sponsorships <clears throat> where um, organisations aren't able to get the talent that they want um, within Australia. Um, and the networking and social media piece Um there's an increased number of candidates who are finding roles through their own network and social media channels, which I've already touched on. Um, and just finally, this sort of concept of different generational behaviour patterns, um, where we are seeing Gen Z and Gen Ys um, basically looking for a workplace that's going to complement their work and life. Um, and to put it plainly, it's being able to, you know, have their cake and eat it too. They want to have their day job that they enjoy, but they maybe want to have their side hustle um, where they're, you know, starting up something on the side with a friend or they want to be able to, you know, do their running club. And yeah, essentially it's just about being able to sort of have it all. <laughs> and, you know, that, that puts, um, us as you know HR practitioners but also for you guys as leaders in your organizations um yeah in a sort of tricky position being able to try and juggle all that so on this I'm going to kick off to Jules and I'm going to turn myself off and meet myself and we'll catch you at the end for Q&A cool thanks Kaz um hi everyone as Kaz uh, mentioned before I'm Julia or Jules um and uh Karen took us, obviously took us through some market and candidate insights and some trends. So what I'm going to be talking to you about um, in the next few slides is more around why things are happening and um, pro provide you with some solutions, hopefully some solutions and strategies that you can take away from today to either embed in your workplace or business um, to try and combat some of these um, trends that are happening. Um, so Kaz touched on Goldilocks employers. So I guess the question is, why are they becoming more um, attractive to employees um, or for all candidates in the market. Um, and I mean, my, me, myself, I've come from a big four down to um, Pitcher, not down to Pitcher Partners, but Pitcher Partners deals with the middle market um, clients and employers. And it really does like give you a sense of family. So yeah, that's becoming more attractive for employees to um, actually step down and go, oh, hang on, you know, I want something that's not kind of not too big, not too small, where I can still um, see my value and impact. Um, so the second point around employees seeing, you know, their work having a direct impact um, to clients or the business um, rather, than being, rather than being absorbed by a big corporate. And when I was doing research for um, this presentation, um, we found that for those of you who are in the business of employing graduates um, or trying to attract that next generation through, um, none of the big corporates made the top 20 in terms of preferences for grad um, employers. So um, it, because, and the reason why that is, is because people don't want to be, or that generation doesn't want to be sucked up by a big corporate. They want to actually see where, um, have a more closer relationship with the work that they're doing, the value and impact that they're delivering. 
um, employees are still getting, um, you know, the learning and development opportunities that they're looking for. So that talks to that career lattice piece. So not technically, they're not technically wanting to join a big organisation and climb that corporate ladder. They're wanting to get more of a breadth of experience um, to add to their toolkit. And employees um, get greater exposure, exposure to leaders and experiences on different projects. So if they're understanding how the business is being run, they've, they're not so far removed from business leaders and decision makers. Um, so they've got that direct line there um, as well. Next slide, Cats. Thank you. So the other thing that um, some of you may have heard of is the employee value proposition. And I just wanted to recognise that this um, you know, you may have heard of this, may not, and different businesses and people are at different stages of this um, and potentially implementing something like this. So I guess what is an EVP? So it's an value, employee value proposition is a succinct way of develop, defining the value and experience your organisation delivers to your employees. And that is underpinned by things like company values, culture awards and um, opportunities. The other thing I'd like to say on this is an EVP to me is a combination of short-term and long-term initiatives. Um, and if you get those right, you will be definitely on your way to attracting and retaining top talent. So when I say short-term, they're things kind of like quick wins, like introducing flexibility um, or a flexible working policy into your organisation, um, having benefits and things for your employees um, that could that can um you know, attract them into the workplace. But the longer term issues are things like, why do we do the work that we do? What's our purpose? What's our value um, that we're delivering um, to clients and businesses um, as and, and our employees as well? So that longer term, term game is that, what is the purpose? Why are we all here? And how are we going to make that happen? Um, I guess if we just go through this wheel, so um, making it unique, your EVP unique to your business. So um, there's no point copying um, your competitor or, um, you know, the, the business next door. You really need to understand why people come to work and why do they do the work that they do. And you as an organisation, um, you know, why are you driven um, to be in, in the business that you're in? Um, it needs to be compelling. So how will you stand out from competitors um, and understanding, um, you know, where you can differentiate yourselves in the market there? Um, it has to be relevant. So this is things like asking your people um, what's, what's valuable to them. And that can be done through, depending on the size of your organisation, that can be done through one-on-ones, pulse checks, culture surveys, things like that, um, just to make sure you're hitting the mark on understanding um, you know, why people love working for your organisation um, and, and, and what benefits and things that they're looking for. Um, the next one is around evolving. So ensuring your, your EVP is fluid and it evolves as your, as your business does. Um, because, I mean, if the last, even the last three or four years is anything to go by, um, you just think about how much we have changed in our work lives or other businesses have had to pivot and change um, so people, your people will want different things at different stages um, of their employment life cycle and your business is going to go through change as well. So making sure that um, you've got your finger on the pulse and make changes where you need to. And then the last stage is marketing your EVP internally, externally. So once you've, you think you've got your EVP ready to go, how do you start to think about how do we have a real impact externally and internally in launching um, an EVP? Um, and making sure people actually know about what you're doing as a business. So um, we have a really good example at Picture Partners. We recently did a relaunch of our EVP earlier on in this year. And they were doing things like when you walked into the floor, there was like a welcome bag with all these goodies in it that got people thinking, oh, what's this? If they hadn't already heard about what was going on. We had people kind of walking in the floors, taking photos um, uh, to post on social media. We had people coming together, talking about, um, you know, what's important to them and why they connect with your CVP and, um, you know, sticking those photos up. So it really created that sense of community and collaboration um, to make sure that A, people understood what the EVP was. Um, internally and externally, we had, um, you know, obviously all the external, external marketing on LinkedIn and LinkedIn and so forth. So if you get this right, your EVP for your business and your people, you will attract and retain 
um, talent at every level. Um, you'll, build, you'll build a reputation as being the place to work in the sector. Um, and it's a way to showcase your and strengthen your brand as well. Next slide. So I just wanted to touch on the next piece, which was flexibility. So um, we found this, I found this stat um, that the HRM Weekly sent out um, earlier this year that 78% of people would not work for an employer without a formalised flexible working policy, um, which I was like, wow, if, if this is this to me, and maybe it's because I'm in the line of work that I am, and I'm sure there's other HR practitioners on the line, but you know, that's a huge number. And when I do, you know, speak to my recruiter friends and things like that, it is definitely still high on the agenda um, for candidates. Um, and like has said earlier, COVID fast-tracked flexibility. But as we dive into the next slide, it's not just about working from home anymore. It's a lot broader than that. So Kaz, next slide, please. Thank you. So in terms of flexibility, so some of these points on the screen here or, or suggestions, um, we acknowledge that flexibility is going to look different for different people, different businesses, because not everyone's sitting in an office four or five days a week. Um, some people are frontline workers. So take this um, as you will, but um, we're not saying this is a one size fits all approach. Um, but like I said earlier, the conversation around flexibility has really shifted so it's no longer just about working from home as we saw in the pandemic and when we were kind of forced to do that. Employees are really looking for a workplace that can support their work and life and trust them to make decisions on where they need to be at any given day, any given time. Um, so it's kind of the, the lens, lens has definitely shifted um, now that we're a few years post-COVID. Um, compressed working weeks. So I'm sure most of you on the on the call would have heard of the compressed working week. Um, there's been a lot of companies and businesses trialing the compressed working week um, with some with having really good success. And there's, I guess, there's pros and cons with, with each of these points, but compressed working weeks um, are, are definitely becoming more and more popular. Um, and what it, and so people are working their five days work within four days as an example but for the full-time pay so that's enabling them to have a three-day weekend um you know while getting all of their work done in those four days um and if I did a bit of research on where did the 40-hour work week come from um and how long has it been a thing or how, how long has it been in place so the 40-hour work week was actually introduced in 1926 by a guy named Henry Ford um and if you think of how much we have evolved as people, as businesses, technology, over you know since the 1920s, it's no wonder that people are now asking or demanding or looking at different ways that they can, um, you know, complete their work. No wonder that businesses are really trying to rethink. Okay, how do I get the best out of my people and my business? Um, so that was a really interesting point. I thought. Um, flex time and flex roles is also another option. So this is really like allowing employees to manage their own work schedules. And that could look like different start and finish times. It could be remote working um, and, and things like job sharing. So if I think about remote working, you know, there are some market leaders out there that are saying to their employees, we don't care where you work as long as you get your work done and the outputs there. And if that means working overseas, working interstate, working from home, um, you really have that flexibility to work um, where you like. Um, and things like job sharing, it's a really classic example where, you know, you might may have an employee with care and responsibilities, whether they've got, you know, children or um, elderly or they're a carer for someone, um, and they may, you know, only be able to work two days a week. How, you know, looking at how you can, if you've got a full time role, looking at what does what does a job share arrangement look like, and how do we actually advertise that and tell people that we're actually supporting that for these for a certain role. So, um, the next one is workspace redesign. So this might be a little bit out of left field in terms of flexibility, but if you think about also um, the way that we work has really shifted so um and some some businesses may still operate this way and that's okay but thinking about things like how people are coming into the office when they're coming in how they're doing different 
carving out different parts of their roles and how are they actually um, performing those roles. So if they've got meetings or if they've got virtual collaboration spaces or if they've got, you know, a combination of in-person and online meetings, um, just incorporating you know, agile ways that your employees can work um, is really important in terms of attracting and retaining talent. And I've experienced this firsthand at a different different employer, but the, they kind of moved to a completely open space office. No one was in no one was in was in an office. So the CEOs were sitting next to the CEO was sitting next to um, you know, his EA or a grad or whoever, whatever desk was free at the time. And it really just broke down barriers. Um, between employees and leaders um, and allowed them to collaborate in a really different way. And it actually put, um, attracted people back into the, um, into the office as well. So it can work twofold. And then things like additional leave. So thinking outside the box about what flexible leave options you can make available to your people. And that may look like um, an example of that could be floating public holidays um, because our um, our public holiday, some of our public holidays are designed around a certain religious holiday. And, um, you know, Easter, for example, not everyone celebrates Easter. So how about looking at different ways that people can flex public holidays um, that where they can actually choose when they take that public holiday? And that may actually fall um, into promoting your DNI strategy as well. I do have an example. I've got, um, you know, someone that uh, was a construction worker he was a foreman and a portion of his workforce um you know participated in prayer, prayer on a friday morning and they allowed you know them to take certain days off for their religious beliefs so it also from an attraction and retention perspective worked really well because they felt valued they felt like you know they could bring their whole selves to work um and and it tick, kind of ticked that dni box where you know everyone was welcome and, and there was respect there for people um in terms of you know their own religious beliefs and a sense of belonging so I guess the takeaway is it's not a one-size-fits-all approach um, making decisions around flexibility or hybrid working um, things that you can offer your people really depends on a what they want and b what you can accommodate as a business like I said not everyone is sitting at a, comp a computer five days a week um, so it's just making sure that um, you're experimenting with these kinds of things and gathering feedback from your employees around what's important to them next slide Kaz and the last thing we wanted to chat about was um, social recruitment. So I think gone are the days where you just post an ad on Seek and hope that candidates apply. It's really transformed now to your networks, um, you know, using social media um, and also finding hidden talent. So the, the people that aren't really actively looking, but, you know, are kind of sitting around going, oh, maybe it's time for a change soon. How do you tap into that? So there's a few different um a few different avenues that Karen and I have kind of um, work, you know, uh, that have performed that have actually worked with some of our clients. So leadership presence is a huge thing. So profile matters. And this isn't just your CEO um, or someone in a leadership role. It, I like to believe that everyone's a leader in a business. Um, so making sure that, you know, you're getting involved and active on LinkedIn, um, on your profiles, writing articles, making sure that people actually know who you are, who you work for, what you stand for, so that when someone says, you know, oh, we've got a job going at X business, people are actually more inclined to know A, who you are and B, who your business is, um, who your business is and who you work for. If you're in the business of hiring internships and grads, um, depending on your industry, may or may not be relevant, but um, Jen um, Z is uh, really, um, you know, looking at, a different type of work um, they're not interested in the nine to five and climbing the corporate ladder they've got different um, you know different income streams and things coming through so um, once you kind of recognize what your recruitment strategy is understanding how you can kind of flex your workplace to address and attract those um, those people or those hires um, and there's other things that you could do, like um, making sure you're tapped into your um, local universities um, and if you're, you know, local schools, if you're in a regional space as well, to start to get that interest and, in, you know, people coming out of school and uni understanding who you are um, and what you do as a business. Um, painting a picture so it's not just about the job, it's it's actually telling candidates about what's it like to work for you. And 
you can do this by once you understand what your EVP is and what your offering is as a business, then you can start to confidently communicate what it's like to work at your organization. So what does a day in the life of an employer X organization look like? The next one is the alumni network, much like we have on the call for today. I think Pitches does it really well um, in terms of, um, you know, keeping in touch with their alumni network um, and staying connected because, you know, if people have a good experience at your workplace, you stay connected, you run things like these webinars, you send out knowledge articles, you're kind of constantly in um, people's minds, you know, they may come back to you one day, or they'll at least speak highly of you to friends and um, other potential candidates. And the other thing is onboarding experience. So making a new employee feel like they're part of the organisation before they even start the job. So what... Um, what we found is that once there's so much competition out there at the moment that just because a candidate accepts a role with you doesn't mean that they're joining on their first day, but they are more likely to join and, and be committed to that offer um, if they're actually getting, um, you know, that, that communication from you throughout that notice period um, and in whatever form that may look like. So it's just staying connected with those candidates and making sure that they feel part of your organisation before they start. Next slide, Kaz. Cool. So just wanted to recap. So what now? So we've taken you through market insights, taken you through some candidates tr candidate trends. We've provided you with some solutions. So it's kind of like a what do I do with this information now? Um, from an EVP perspective, irrespective of your role, um, we think everyone has the opportunity to impact, you know, either creating an EVP or gathering feedback or speaking to, um, you know, someone in the leadership position around what the team's saying, how the team's feeling, that kind of thing. Or you may be more in more of a mature business where, you know, there are salary, uh, sorry, culture surveys happening, um, you know, already. So um, just thinking about, how you can influence that. If you don't have an EVP or your business doesn't have an EVP, start to explore what one could look like um, by, you know, gathering some data, whether that's through conversation or surveys. The second thing is implement and um, explore and implement flexible solutions that fit. So this may mean, depending on the maturity of the, your business, getting a flexible working policy together as a starting point. Um, or it could be you may be at a more mature stage where you can start to explore, um, hey, let's trial a four-day working week or a compressed working week for this team and these people. So um, that's something else that you can look at from a flexibility perspective. And social recruitment strategy. So the next time you have an open role, um, just pause and reflect on who you're recruiting, what you need before you actually jump into writing a job description because that can really change, um, you know, the candidate's um, that you're attracting and how you kind of target, um, you know, the exact employee that you're looking for. That is the end of our slides. We do have some time for questions. Yeah, we have. Um, let me just read that out. So it's from Vincent. Thank you, Vincent, for your question. Um, is there a big shift in the use of traditional recruiters and businesses creating their own in-house recruitment resource to stay, sorry, to stay focus on online direct recruitment? Um, so I'm happy to sort of share some insight here, Jules, and then very happy for you to also. Um, so I have found that there's still certainly um, a push for traditional recruiters, um, but I think people are probably double dipping a little bit more. I think there was maybe a little bit more um, kind of exclusivity around working with certain agencies um, and sort of having loyalty to those agencies. But I think because of where the market has gone and because there is such, um, I guess, yeah, such a lack of um, talent, um, people are finding that they're having to kind of create their own um, opportunities um, outside of just, yeah, that relationship. Um, you know, I can certainly share from, you know, an evolution of our offering perspective. Um, I know it's a little bit different because um, of the offering that we have, but perfect example is Picture Partners, um, you know, was able to offer our clients um, a recruitment offering. So we never intended to go out and do that, but our clients were coming to us because of the um, 
relationship that you know we had as their trusted advisor um, and so partners from all over the firm would be calling us to say you know Kaz Jules can you help us you know we've got so-and-so client who's looking for a CFO um, they're not able to find the right people out in the market through agency can you help um, and that's where we've been able to lean on the Pitcher Partners alumni network at times which has been fabulous to find great people um, or you know run our own campaign which has been a little bit more um, yeah, sort of different to what they may have experienced in-house. Um, so, yeah, that's sort of my piece. Jules, did you want to add anything to that? No, I think you um, uh, answered that um, the way I would have, Kaz. It's really a blend of both, right? Some people are still, I mean, recruiters still have a really big talent pool. A lot of them have been in the game for a long time. So, um, so there is a bit of both happening for sure. This by no means is about, you know, pushing our offering, but it goes without saying we love all of you. <laughs> We're like family. So if there's ever a time that you guys wanted to reach out and just, yeah, talk about what's happening um, in your organisations or if you're wanting to ever float, um, yeah, anything that's sort of going on where you need some advice. Um, or need any support um, in this sort of PNC space, um, we're always really open to having a conversation and supporting in any way that we can. Um, cool. Okay. Well, it, yeah, looks like everyone's shutting up shop, so um, we won't force it any longer than we need to. Um, but look, thank you so, so much um, for being able to join us today. We really appreciate your time. Um, and yeah, we, um, yeah, hope that you've been able to walk away from today from, with some really tangible, um, you know, sort of pieces of information that, um, yeah, you feel like you can take into your business. Um, as I mentioned at the outset, um, we will be sharing this, it will be recorded and you will receive the slides. So hopefully that's something that you can refer to, um, once we close the call. Um, but yeah, as I said, if there's anything else that you need, please don't hesitate to reach out and, um, yeah, all the best. Thank you.